Amen. Deuteronomy chapter number 16, verse number 9. If you found it, say praise the Lord. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such a time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of a free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. And thou shalt rejoice. Look at somebody, tell them you shall rejoice. Thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter, and thy manservant and thy maidservant. I understood the part where it said you rejoice in your sons and daughters, but then he tells people that are in slavery to rejoice, right? Manservant maid servant people that are in bondage he tells them to rejoice and the Levite that's within thy gates that's the ministry I understand the ministry rejoicing but he didn't say only the ministry he said the stranger the strangers were the ones that were not in covenant they were not they weren't if you will saved yet and the fatherless what does the fatherless an orphan have to worship about now, if you notice, he said, you worship and your sons and your daughters. He didn't say anything about wives. But then he goes here and he says, and the widow. He's listing these people that appear to have nothing to rejoice about. The stranger, the fatherless, and the widow that are among you in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and do these statutes. I'm going to preach for a while this morning a message titled, What to Do While You Wait. Anybody here like to wait? No, nope, nobody likes to wait. I hate to wait. I'm so glad that we didn't take our kids to amusement parks because I hate standing in line almost as much as I hate anything else in this world. Amen. Brother Bobby, I'm going to expect one of those later too. I hate to wait. Feels like you're wasting time when you wait, don't it? Doesn't it? Anybody love being the 10th car in the drive-thru? You can be the 10th car in the drive-thru and get through a lot faster than if you're the first car at McDonald's. If you're the 10th car at the Chick-fil-A drive-thru, you're faster than the first car. That's not... I, I got amens about that. I'm counting these amens. I'm expecting them to redeem later. I hate to wait. But I'm preaching this morning what to do while you wait. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me to preach. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost, God, let it flow in this message and into our hearts, into the ear of the hearer, God, I pray that you would confirm your word with signs following today. In the name of Jesus, God, I praise you and I worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Amen. And you can be seated. Our text this morning concerns what is called the Feast of Weeks in this particular passage. The Feast of Weeks is actually a Jewish holiday that goes by a handful of particular names. In Hebrew, it's called Shavuot or Shavos. It's a Jewish holiday that occurs 
on the sixth day of the Hebrew month of Savan, which on our calendar can fall anywhere from May 15th to June the 14th. This year, Shavuot began on the evening of Saturday, June the 4th, so that would be yesterday evening at sundown. It will end tomorrow evening at sundown, making today the main day of celebration of what is known as the Feast of Weeks. In the New Testament, the Feast of Weeks is called by the word Pentecost. So today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, marked the beginning of the wheat harvest in the land of Israel. You can find that in Exodus 34 and 22. It commemorates the anniversary of the day when God gave the Torah to the nation of Israel on Mount Sinai. The Jews would celebrate Passover when they commemorated their deliverance from Egypt. All of this stuff happens on this particular holiday. The giving of the law, Passover and their deliverance from Egypt that came when they put the blood of the lamb on their house. On the second day of the feast of Passover, they, I'm sorry, of not Passover, but the, yeah, the feast of Passover, they would begin to do something called counting the Omer. This counting the Omer would continue for seven weeks, 49 days. An omer is a sheaf of unthreshed grain. Every day they would count the omer or they would take a sheaf of grain to the house of God, to the temple. For 49 days they would count the omer until the day of Pentecost. It was the countdown to Pentecost coming. At the beginning, Pentecost commemorated the beginning of the wheat harvest. And so on the 50th day, they counted was the day of Pentecost. Penta meaning 50, 50 days after Passover. And so what they were doing from Passover when they were set free from Egypt until Pentecost when the wheat harvest came, they would fill that time in between those seven weeks by bringing a sheaf of barley grain to the house of God. And they would bring that, that sheaf of barley and they would wave it before the Lord as a free will offering of praise to God. And it was called counting the omer or counting the sheaf. And they would count for 49 days. The idea of counting each day represents spiritual preparation and anticipation for the harvest that would come. According to the scriptures, they would take this sheaf of barley grain to the house of God as their sacrifice to the Lord. For 49 days, they would bring an offering of thanksgiving to God. It's interesting to discover, to me it's interesting to discover how items get their names. Brother Ronnie Cummins came in my office this morning and, and he was telling me how two particular phrases came into being. And, uh, and, and, and we were, he, he was telling me how these two particular phrases, how they developed and, and how, what they mean and how we got them in our vocabulary. And I mentioned to him that it's interesting to me how words develop. The ancient Hebrews, they had ways where they would develop like the word manna. When manna fell from heaven, they looked out, they woke up in the morning, they saw the ground covered with manna and they didn't know what it was so they called it manna. The Bible says, for they wist not what it was. The word manna means what is it? And so they called it, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. And so the word that they gave manna, it reflected what they thought of it. I don't know what it is, so we're going to call it, what is it? It's like Whataburger. 
I don't know what that's, I don't know if it's beef or not. It's just a water burger. Don't, I, I've, I've, I've hit three fast food restaurants already this morning. But they called it manna because they didn't know what it was. And so that's just what they called it. They named it exactly what they thought about it. The word barley, because it was a, a sheaf of barley that they would bring for these 49 days. The word barley is interesting to me because the ancient Hebrews, when they found this grain, either growing wild or perhaps cultivated by some surrounding people group, that, that they, they, they found barley. And when they were trying to think of what to call it, they came up with the word, the Hebrew word, the root word is the word sa'ar. In the Hebrew, and I, I'm probably not saying it right, but I'm saying it close enough. And so they called it, they called it Sar. Sar, the root word, means a storm. It means to shiver in fear, to be horribly afraid, to roil like a storm, to be tempestuous, to come like a whirlwind. It means to be horrible, to shiver to dread, to be afraid, to come as a storm. My guess is that the first Hebrew to try barley didn't like it very much. Because when they develop the word for it, they find this grain and they, they look at it and they taste it and they try it and they apply to it a word that means horribly afraid, to roil like a storm. It describes either their thought about the barley or the situation they were going through when they found it. A horrible storm, to be afraid, to dread. Their mind, when they got this barley, they associated it with these negative words and emotions. We don't really use barley in our modern American culture much. But it was much more common in the agrarian societies of ancient Israel. In Bible times, barley was more widely cultivated than now. It was the main food of the poor people. It was always valued less than wheat. Barley was the common food that they would grow for their livestock, for their horses and their donkeys. Barley bread was eaten primarily by the poorest people in society. Are you still with me? During a terrible famine, Elisha prophesied that by the next day, one measure of meat of wheat flour, one measure of wheat flour would sell for a shekel. At the same time, tomorrow, two measures of barley will be sold for a shekel. So wheat was twice as valuable as barley. In the story of Ruth and Naomi, Ruth is, according to the scripture, beautiful. Boaz is smitten by her beautiful looks. But good looks can mask a wicked heart and a bad attitude. Some of you young people ought to say amen right there. Boaz was smitten by her good looks, but he wouldn't want to redeem her if her attitude and character were less than her looks. And so he instructs his servant to leave some handfuls of barley in the field. And when Ruth is gleaning the field of barley. Now, if you're poor, you grow barley. If you're po, you glean barley out of someone else's field. Ruth wasn't poor. Ruth was po. She didn't even have her own barley field. She has to glean the cheapest of grain from someone else's field because she's so destitute on her own 
that she can't even afford to grow her own barley. She's got to get someone else's barley. But Boaz knows that if this beautiful lady named Ruth is humble enough to be able to glean barley out of somebody else's field, then she's not too proud to stand before God. And so Ruth 2 and 17 says, So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. As beautiful as she was, she wasn't too proud to get some barley. It was while Ruth was gleaning this field of barley that Boaz decided, I'm going to redeem her from her poverty. In John 6, 9, and 10, Jesus fed multitudes with five barley loaves. Jesus took a poor boy's lunch. Again, barley bread was eaten by the poorest of the poor. He took the lunch of one of the poorest boys in the community. And by the time he was done, he fed 5,000 with a poor boy's lunch. He put a blessing on the poor and the unappreciated and the less valuable and the ones that didn't have anything. A poor boy's lunch feeds a multitude. A poor woman's gleaning gives her the lineage of a king. And so they would celebrate in ancient Israel, they would celebrate Passover, the celebration of when the blood was put on the house And they were brought out of Egypt. What a great celebration to be brought out of Egypt. And they would look ahead to the wheat harvest when Pentecost would come. And their pockets would be filled with the joy and the money from the wheat harvest. But what do you do while you're waiting between Passover and Pentecost? What do you do with all these 49 days in between? These seven weeks in between? When you're in between your blessing of deliverance and your blessing of Pentecost, what do you do while you wait? What do you do while you wait on your blessing to come? What do you do while you wait on your breakthrough? What do you do while you wait for your healing? What do you do while you wait for your joy? What do you do while you wait for your deliverance? What do you do while you wait on your children to come back to God or your spouse to come back to God? What do you do while you wait on a doctor to give you a good report? What do you do while you wait for your financial blessing? I'm going to tell you it matters what you do while you wait. Amen. Come on, warm up your praise just a little bit. It is a peasant's offering. When you bring barley and wave it before God, what you're waving before God is the least valuable of all the grains. It's the food for the poor and the destitute that has nothing and has no hope. It's the very least of what you can bring to God. It's not wheat flour. It's not bringing a sheaf of wheat that's highly valuable, but it's bringing what has little or no value and waving it before God in hopes that someday soon I'll get my wheat harvest and I'll get my breakthrough. I'll give God what I got when I got little because if I give him what I have when I have nothing, he'll give me what I need when Pentecost comes. Oh, I wish somebody praised him right now. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And so when they had, when, when all they had was the barley harvest, when all they had was that barley, and you remember when they had barley, you remember when they named it something that the root word means pain, and it means a storm, and it means horrible, and it means afraid, and it has all these negative emotions attached to it. And that's what they thought about the barley, all those negative attachments to the barley harvest. But when they brought that stuff 
that was hurting and fearful and broken and useless and weak and weary and with no value. But they brought it to God and they said, God, I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to give you my fear. I'm going to give you my my anxiety. I'm going to give you my storm. I'm going to give you what is worth nothing in this world because I know that if I bring it to you, that someday my Pentecost is coming. Oh, what do you do while you wait? Can I tell you this? I've seen people shout when everything was good. I've seen them shout in wheat phases of life, if you will. I've seen them shout when everything was going good. I've seen them shout when everything was all right. I've seen them shout when the doctor's report was good. I've seen them shout when the bank account level was good. I've seen them shout when everything was all right. But what are you going to do while you wait for that to happen? Uh, What are you going to do in between your Passover and your Pentecost? It matters what you do while you wait. Because if you can't wave your barley before God, you can't get your wheat harvest when the time comes. I've come to preach to some people today that if you can't praise God when you've got nothing, you may never get your Pentecost. you got to praise Him when your heart's broken and praise Him when you're wounded and praise Him in your storm and praise Him in your fear and praise Him in your trial. Praise Him when you got no money. Praise Him when you got no joy. If you can't praise Him with your barley, you can never have your Pentecost. It matters what you do while you wait. Hallelujah. A man that would not count the omer. A man that couldn't couldn't learn how to rejoice over his barley harvest was a man who didn't deserve his wheat harvest. A man that couldn't take the 49 days to thank God for the peasant food was a man that didn't deserve to have the king's food. A man that couldn't praise God when he had the poor man's bread was a man that didn't deserve to have the king's bread. You can't have the wheat harvest if you don't count the omer between Passover and Pentecost. You can't have the wheat harvest if you don't learn how to praise him. I get, look, don't tell me how bad everything is and then sit like a bump on a log and blame God. It's not God's fault. You got to learn to praise when you got barley or you'll never have wheat. Don't complain with life's not good if you can't praise him in the middle of it all. Woo, Jesus, help me, God. What I'm trying to do is to preach to some folks who have some brokenness in their life. Knowing that while I do when all I have is barley prepares me for my Pentecost that's coming my way. If I can't count the omer when everything is poverty and everything is broken and everything is fearful and everything's a storm, if I can't find a way to raise my hand to heaven when all I've got is barley, when all I've got is trouble, when all I've got is fear, when all I've got is storms, if I can't wave that before God, then I can't get my Pentecost because it matters what you do while you wait. I'm preaching to some people who are waiting for your breakthrough. Don't just sit there while you wait. I'm preaching to some people who are waiting for your revival. Don't just sit there while you wait. It matters what you do while you wait. You can't have Pentecost if you don't learn how to praise him when it's nothing but barley. You got to count the omer. If you don't wave the barley before the Lord, you can't have your Pentecost. The Lord says, for, for, and that they call it the Feast of the Weeks. You see, we concentrate, the Old Testament never called it Pentecost. Just to be sure that I had that point right, 
I, I got my, my, my computer out and I did a, a search on my Bible program of Pentecost. And the word Pentecost didn't appear in the Old Testament at all. Only appeared in the New Testament. The Old Testament calls it the Feast of Weeks. To them, the focus was not on the end result. The focus was on the process. The focus was not on the end of the process. It was what do you do on day one when you're a long way from your revival? Can you still praise God when your revival is days and weeks away? It's called the Feast of Weeks because you got to be willing to invest today in something that may not happen for weeks down the line. You have to lift your hand and wave your offering before God when it's a long time until your breakthrough comes. I'm preaching to some people. I don't know when your breakthrough's going to come, but I know this much. You better learn how to count the omer between now and then because it matters what you do while you wait. Carson, I, I, I thought this morning how many people's Pentecosts have been aborted because they didn't praise him when all they had was barley. I wonder how many churches missed their revival because when it wasn't red hot Holy Ghost being poured out everywhere, they didn't get up off their seat and worship God. I wonder how many families never got the revival that God wanted to send to their children and the grandchildren and the nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters because while it was cold and nothing but barley that they couldn't get up and praise God, there's nothing worse than a dead apostolic. I know people say there's nothing worse than a dead apostolic church, but don't blame the church because the church is made up of people. It can't be a dead apostolic church if it doesn't have dead apostolic people in it. You gotta learn how to count when nothing's happening. When you don't feel anything, I still wave my praise before God. When I'm full of fear and I don't know how it's gonna work out, I still wave it before God. You gotta learn, it matters what you do while you wait. There might be somebody here right now. You need a breakthrough so bad that you don't know if you can make it. I'm going to tell you, you can make it, but you can't make it if you don't do something while you wait. It's that wave offering that prepares me for my Pentecost. The day of Pentecost in Acts 2 is the powerful birthday of the church. It was on this holiday that God chose to pour out his spirit on his people. Acts 1 tells us about Jesus' commission. Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Let me tell our new folks that are still struggling with stuff in your life, you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because when you get the Holy Ghost, you get power to overcome the bondages of your life. You get power to break free from addiction. You get power to have a life that's filled with the glory of God. What we need is Pentecostal power to flow in this place. You shall receive. You'll have power over your addiction. You'll have power over your depression. You'll have power over your struggles. You need the power of the Holy Ghost. I wish somebody that has it would say amen right now. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. And after this, after Jesus said these words, the ascension happened. He rose into heaven. The angels told the people, why stand you here gazing? Why are you just standing around? You're just standing here looking. Don't you know it matters what you do while you wait? What are you just standing around doing nothing for? Why stand you here gazing? It matters what you do while you wait. You got Pentecost that's been promised to you. You got Pentecost that has been promised. You'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But you'll never get Pentecost if you just stand here gazing and doing nothing because it matters what you do. 
while you wait. So here's the way Luke tells it. The Gospel of Luke tells the same portion. He led them out, Luke 24 and 50. This is the same passage. What I just read to you was the Acts version. Now it's the Luke version, the book of Luke's version. Luke 24 and 50. He led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And it came to pass that while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So you get it? It's the same moment. It's the same moment written about in Acts 1 as was written about in Luke 24. In Acts 1, you will see power. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. You'll be witnesses. And then he's received up into heaven. And the angel says, why stand you here gazing? Luke says that he lifted his hands and blessed them. It came to pass. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. And they worshiped him. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy. What do you do while you're waiting on Pentecost to come? Verse 53, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. That's what you do while you wait on your Pentecost. That's what you do while you wait on your healing. That's what you do while you wait on your miracle. That's what you do while you wait on your breakthrough. That's what you do while you wait on your deliverance. You come to the house of God and you praise him and bless him and worship him. You wave the sheaf of barley. Oh, God. It's what you do. They didn't just idly sit back and wait for a better day. They spent their preparation counting the om or offering praise and thanksgiving to God. And then that went on, not just for one day. You see, the problem that we have is we are so impatient that we want to pray now and get it by the time we stand up from the altar. We want to close our eyes and say, God, I need a miracle. And by the time we open our eyes, if it hasn't happened yet, we say, well, I guess it's not going to happen. No, sometimes you got to go back day after day after day. On day one, they didn't see Jesus. On day two, they didn't see Jesus. On day three, they didn't see Jesus. They didn't see Jesus in the first week or the second week or the third week. But what did they do? I'm still going to the house of God and I'm still going to praise him. It's been two weeks since I've seen him, but I'm still going to praise him. It's been three weeks since I saw him, but I'm still going to bring my praise. It's barley. I don't know what it's, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I'm a little afraid it may not work out, but I'm still coming. And six weeks goes by and seven weeks goes by. And then on the 50th day, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Brother Sanford, you remember being in that place just a couple of years ago. You remember we were in the upper room together, amen, in Jerusalem. And I sat there on a little, there was a rock in the, I don't know where that rock came from, but it was in the middle of that room. And I sat on that rock and I opened my Bible app and I began to read Acts chapter number two. And as I began to read Acts chapter number two, the Holy Ghost began to move on me in a way that I hadn't experienced in a long time. Amen. I, I could ima- man, I could imagine what it was to have been like in that room on that very first day of the church in Acts chapter number two when these people but they hadn't been they weren't like me that had just had a good red hot church service just a Sunday night before they had been seven weeks since they had seen Jesus it had been seven weeks since they had heard his voice it had been seven weeks since there was any contact with him but on that 50th morning when they went in that upper room when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven uh, as of a rushing mighty wind you gotta be in the upper room when your Pentecost comes you gotta show up you gotta show up you gotta keep showing up 
when you don't feel it, show up. When you don't feel like it. Oh, Jesus. Well, pastor, I just don't, just don't feel anything. I had somebody tell me they had the Holy Ghost. They got the Holy Ghost in the 90s, maybe before that. I met them in the 90s. They told me a few months ago, Pastor V, I just don't, I don't know if I can, I just don't feel anything. I just don't feel anything. Well, you're not going to feel anything if you show up once every four or five weeks. They were daily in the temple praising God when they didn't feel anything, when they didn't see anything, when nothing happened in their life. They kept showing up when there wasn't, and they showed up and they didn't just sit there. Just sit there. They're in church. I wonder what's on Amazon today. Oh. What's on Amazon today? Oh my goodness, look at that. They got, a, they got an ice machine. An ice, it'll make 90 pounds a day and it's $426.99. Huh. I wonder what the, oh, hey look, somebody just sent me a text. They're in church. What are they doing? They're not supposed to be texting me while they're in the house of God, dear Lord. What? Oh, well, I'm not supposed to be answering, but I am anyway. Oh, dear God. When, when is that preacher going to quit? And then you're going to complain that you don't feel anything. The reason you don't feel anything is because you have never mastered the barley harvest. You never learned how to be thankful for your barley harvest when it's nothing but fear and anxiety and dread and worry. You didn't count the omer when you had nothing. So God says, I can't trust you with the wheat harvest because you never learn how to appreciate when I don't give you anything. I'm telling somebody right now, your miracle is on the other side of you daily being in the temple praising God when you don't feel it. What are you doing while you wait? What are you doing while you wait? There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know why they were baptized with the Holy Ghost on day 50? Because they worshiped on day one and two and three. I don't know what day you're on, but I'd be worshiping right now if I were you. Because it matters while you, what you do while you wait. Oh, God. Dear God in heaven. Ah. Well, if that preacher would pray for me, I'd... If that preacher come pray for me, maybe I'd get what I need. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible said that they went to the elders and asked for prayer. It's not my job to come to you and ask you if you want to break through. It's not my job to come find you where you are and say, would you like to get touched from God? It's your job to make your way to the elders of the church and say, pray for me. That's Bible. Am I in the Bible? I'm in James chapter number five. They called for the elders of the church. Sometimes you got to get up and call yourself. I'm preaching to some people that you need Pentecost more than you know you need it. You need it so bad, you don't even realize you need it. But you need a breakthrough. Your family needs a breakthrough. Your mind needs a breakthrough. Your spirit needs a breakthrough. But you'll never get it if you wait on it to come. It matters what you do while you wait. I looked it up last, last year on Pentecost Sunday. I said this, and I quote. This is what I said a year ago. I'm here to prophesy your Pentecost. There is indeed going to be a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost on your church. 
Praise God. And over a hundred baptisms later, God did what God said he would do. And I'm prophesying again today that you can have your breakthrough, but you got to start counting the omer. When you don't feel anything, you still wave your praise before God. When you, if it goes weeks and you don't feel it, you keep coming to church. You don't lay out. You don't take nights off. You don't stop. You got to love Pentecost more than you love watching your ball game tonight. You got to love Pentecost more than you love laying around on Wednesday night. I know I'm preaching a little bit hard, but I'm talking about it matters what you do while you wait. There's a whole church having revival all around you. And it's going to keep happening around you unless you let it get in you. It matters what you do while you wait. I've come again to prophesy a year later something over some people in this congregation who are dealing with spiritual difficulties. Some of you have faced terrible hardship. Some of you, can I, and, and I'm not talking to everybody, and maybe only the ones that get offended now will be the ones I'm talking to, but some of you have failed to really discipline yourself to live for God holy. And that's nobody's fault but your own. Some are just dealing with the trials and difficulties of life. You're in the barley phase of your harvest. Some by your own decisions and some beyond your control. But you're in the barley phase. Fear, storms, dread, anxiety. All the meanings of that root word. But I've come to prophesy there's a Pentecost coming for you. If you'll count the omer while you wait. If you'll just keep coming to church and praising God. And serving God when you don't feel anything. It may take weeks, but if you'll be faithful to it, I'm prophesying it one more time. Just like what I prophesied one year ago has come true for this church. What I'm prophesying right now will come true for you if you'll count the omer in your barley phase and you'll consistently serve God and be faithful. There is a Pentecost coming for you too. It's not just for the meth addict that comes in. It's not just for the broken, but for you too. You have a Pentecost waiting, but it matters what you do while you wait. I mean, when they looked at barley, they named it fear. Dread storm. They said, if this is all I got, here, God. How long are you going to wave it? Till Pentecost? How long are you going to bring your wounds to the Lord? Till Pentecost? How long are you going to bring your trouble? and your anxiety and still come and worship God. How long are you going to keep doing? It doesn't work. I mean, it's been weeks. How long are you going to do it until Pentecost comes? Because what I'm doing is I'm counting the omer for my life. I'm counting the omer for my family. I'm counting the omer for my children. I'm counting the omer for my, for my husband. I'm counting the omer for my wife. I'm counting the omer for my healing. I'm counting the omer for my financial miracle. I'm counting the omer. How long am I going to do it? I'm going to do it till my Pentecost comes. I'm trying to get somebody right now that's going through trial just to begin to praise God and say, I don't know how long it's going to take, but no matter how long it takes, that's how long I'm going to do it. It matters what you do while you wait. Stand with me this morning. I think it's still morning. Yeah, it's still morning. Here's the interesting thing. God knew what that barley represented. He knew it was the meal for the poorest of the poor. 
He knew. He knew that it was horse feed. That's why they grow it, to feed their horses and mules. It just so happened that while the rich people grew it to feed their horses and mules, the poor people found out they could live off of it too. God knew it was horse food. Right? You all with me still? God knew that's just poor people food and horse food. But God said, bring it to me. Because it's not about the barley. It's about the one bringing it. You don't have to have anything for me to want you to come. You don't have to have wheat for me to want you. You don't have to have it all together for me to want you. You don't have to have it all together for me to want you in my house. You bring your barley. I'm perfectly happy. I understand the other gods and the other kings may not want it, but I'm perfectly happy with you bringing me something that has no value to the rest of the world because it's not about the barley. It's about you. It's about you bringing it. It's about you being in my presence. And I've come to tell somebody, maybe you don't have a good offering to bring. Maybe you don't have a big offering to bring. Maybe you don't have a life that's all together. Maybe you don't have everything everything tied up just like you want it. Maybe your life isn't everything that you wish it would be, but God's not concerned with the offering you bring. He's concerning with the bringer of the offering so you can bring it right now. You can just bring yourself to God. When you got nothing, you can bring it and say, God, here I am. It's not about the barley. It's about the wave. about the barley. It's all about the wave. I will lift up my hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord because it's about my hand, not what's in it. Bring your horse feed. Bring your donkey food. Bring your storm and your fear and your anxiety and your trouble and your tribulation and your pain and your suffering. You don't have to be a king for me to want you. You don't have to have it all together for me to invite you. As a matter of fact, I invite you to come and bring your barley. And if you'll bring me your barley, I'll give you my wheat. I'll give you my Pentecost. Why don't you give him an offering of praise right now? Doesn't have to sound like anybody else's. Why don't you bring him your barley? If all you got is fear, then bring him your fear. If all you've got is storms, then bring your storms. He said, bring your barley. Because it matters what you do. While you're waiting. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, move here. Oh, come on. Why don't you bring your praise to it? Oh, come on. That's right. Lift it up to him. There's a miracle in the house. There's a Pentecost in the house. so poor I don't have anything to bring I said that's okay just bring that that's cool
lift him up tonight, this morning. Why don't we lift him up? Come on, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Because praise is what we do. Praise is what we do. Come on, come on, lift him up in the room. Praise is what we do, Jesus. We worship you. No matter the circumstance, no matter the problem, praise is what we do. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Praise is what we do. Come on, worship Him. Lift Him up. Praise His name. Praise Him because Pentecost is on its way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, can we lift up a sound of praise in the room? Oh, clap your hands, all you people. And shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Come on, oh, clap your hands, all you people, all you people, all you people. And shout unto God with the voice of triumph. You know what that means? You shout like you won the victory. That means you shout like the battle is already won. That means you shout uh, like you've already experienced Pentecost. Uh, I thought that, that's like, that means you shout uh, like the miracle. Uh, yeah, I feel it right now. That means you shout uh, like the miracle has already happened. Uh, like the healing has already happened. Uh, like the breakthrough has already happened. Uh, oh, we shout unto you with the voice of triumph. Whatever you, I'm almost done. Whatever the situation is, whatever the prayer you've been praying is, I want you to shout in just a second. I want you to shout with all your might that I've got it. Are you ready? Are you ready? I want you to shout, I've got it. Whatever it is, I got it. My problem is gone. My answer is here. I've got it. Do you believe it this morning? Do you believe it this morning? Do you believe it one more time? Why don't you shout unto God and clap your hands? Thank you, Jesus. Don't forget about first steps immediately after service. Um, for those of you that are new members, guests, Remember, be free at 5 o'clock, prayer at 6, and church at 6.30. You don't want to miss what's going to happen tonight in the presence of the Lord. Be here. Let's pray in dismissal. Lord, we thank you for answering us. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for encouraging us. We thank you for, for moving us into a deeper place with you. And we're praying right now that the seed of the word would be sown into good ground and bring forth much fruit. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You are dismissed today in the fear of the Lord. <laughs>